Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. Welcome back to the show, everybody, and this is a ortho episode. More specifically, it's a clinical episode in the sense that if you're a clinician, you get to unlock an AMA PRA Category 1 CME credit for free. That's right. So all you got to do is listen to this show, and then in the show notes, just click the link that you see for the uh, CME link. Go and write down for you know, a few sentences of what you learn and how you apply, and you'll unlock that AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Now, who do we have on the show today? Well, we have on the show a good friend of mine from the interwebs, uh, Dr. Matt Barber, who is a speaker and a surgeon and innovator, and more importantly, uh, a clinician who focuses his entire cl- practice around all aspects of knee and hip replacement surgery. Uh, he also has a fantastic podcast in the orthopedic space called Ortho Real. Uh, uh, real spelled R-E-A-L. So be sure to check it out on Spotify and Apple and other places. And of course, give him a give him a five star review. And so on here, uh, you know, Matt Matt and I have been connected through um, through LinkedIn for some time, and we finally met in person at WAS. So I had him on the show to talk about the state of orthopedic surgery, but more specifically, like how he likes to think about using LinkedIn to discover new technology and products, how he uses it to keep himself uh, up to date clinically and then engage with peers. Now, if you are a orthopedic surgeon and you're looking to leverage LinkedIn to become a digital opinion leader, to essentially uh, market your practice, market yourself, attract not only patients, but opportunities from, let's say, startups to investors and beyond, you know, I actually put together a course called the digital opinion leadership masterclass first off we're focusing on ortho so the first one it's all orthopedic related all orthopedic focus and you can unlock 25 ama pra category one cme credits so you get 25 credits by going through this program and unlocking them it's only 129 dollars and along with the program which is self-paced you get to also get into a private uh, DOL group with other orthopedic surgeons. So if you're interested in that, go to the website www.orthodigitalopinionleader.com. That's www.orthodigitalopinionleader.com. Join the course. Again, it's self-paced. You can finish it probably within a couple hours on the weekend, or you can take it, you know, as long as you want. You, you essentially own the content once you once you uh, purchase it, and then you'll be able to get into that private group with other orthopedic surgeons. So it's a great program. I, I'm having so much fun interacting with other surgeons in there and helping them out. So with that being said, let's get on to this episode with Matt Barber. Enjoy. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. And um, just as a reminder for those who are clinicians, and if anything, probably just fellow orthopedic surgeons, don't forget to claim your AMA PRA Category 1 CME credit by listening to this episode. Just click the show notes below. Go ahead and write a few sentences of what you learned, and you get a free credit. Why is it free? Because the state of MedTech is bankrolling all of it, and we want to make sure that you benefit from this episode. So I'm joined by my good friend, uh, somebody who I've befriended through the you know, magic of LinkedIn. And that's Dr. Matt Barber. Dr. Barber, it's good to see you. How are you doing today? Doing awesome, Omar. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I've enjoyed talking with you in the past and looking forward to today. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, just a quick plug. I mean, you do, you have a podcast yourself. What's the name of the podcast? Yeah. uh, Ortho Real. Uh, You can see the name in the background there. Uh, It's one of my favorite, one of my favorite logos, but it's, it's out there. It, it's such an awesome logo too, by the way. I love that. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, Dr. Barber, we got a you know a few things we want to we want to talk about today. One of those things, I mean, of course, is digital opinion leadership. You've done a great job on LinkedIn. The numbers are are in, and you know, again, like the orthopedic community on LinkedIn continues to trend upwards in terms of the number of orthopedic surgeons on LinkedIn, and more importantly, the number who are posting original content, right? Um, but you know, the other side of this episode is that we want to talk about like 
interesting technologies that are in the orthopedic suite. Um, you know, you're in practice uh, down in, in Alabama, you've been, you know, quite active. And so let's kind of start with like, what are some technologies that kind of have you excited in the OR and why? Yeah, well, and those two things have evolved together. Uh, I think interest in technology and talking about those things and interacting on some of those things is part of what's driven online conversations, some of that digital opinion leadership, some of that that following that you see in, in social media circles. Um, and, and mine has just been telling my story. It's what would happen if I just opened up my professional life and lived it in a glass house and talk to people while I was learning, while I was integrating new technologies and, and seeing what what works and what didn't and what I loved and what other people might love. Um, and quite frankly, there's a lot of it. And I'm sort of always looking at those things. Uh, for me right now, AI is interesting and exciting. Um, I think there's part of it that we don't know what to do with and, and part of it that we're finally seeing some dots connect. Uh, I'm on a project right now that's winding its way through the FDA where we're using patient specific instrumentation for total knee replacement. And it's got some features that are a little more efficient and a little better than what's gone on before. But the, the interesting part, the breakthrough part with that is the use of AI in translating 2D images into 3D models. And so historically, that's always had to happen uh, with CT or MRI for creation of those guides. But this system allows it to be done with a couple of uh, regular x-rays with a, a size marker on them uh, because of the, the AI technology. Interesting. You know, AI is one of those things that's kind of like thrown around quite a bit in the med tech industry. And, you know, one side of it is like, I'm trying to I'm trying to get a gauge of like how ready certain specialties are for AI. I mean, I think the best case scenario for AI or best use case would be like pathology and radiology because it just makes so, a lot of sense. You know, computer vision was something that has been around for a good amount of time. And, you know, layering AI on top of that makes sense. You know, for orthopedic surgery, you know, uh, as a surgeon, you spend thousands of hours uh developing the skill set to perform certain surgery, right? How open-minded do you think most orthopedic surgeons are when it comes to adopting AI? I think it'll come down to what it's being used for. And that's what you touched on is right now it's sort of this black box or it's AI blank, blank, blank. And we, we don't know what the steps are beyond that and what it's going to accomplish. I think to me, the most interesting part sort of at the outset is maybe the computational power of it to assess data. So if we we have some things because of patient specific instruments, because of robotics, where we have objective measurements and data points about what we did on the front end with some of these surgeries, I think the holy grail is being able to mate that to follow up data to functional results, to patient satisfaction. And, and for that immense computational power to be used to help us stratify which patients need which treatments. And, okay, if this, then this is the best for this maximum outcome. Uh, because there's so, so many variables that we're often manipulating in combination and, and figuring that part out as the is the art that maybe we can introduce a little more science to if we've got that that AI computational power. Got it. You know, do you feel like do you feel like the future of orthopedic surgery is more in the adoption, mass adoption of robotics, or is it more so on the AI side? Uh, I don't know, uh, and they'll they'll evolve together. And you you touched on that part about experience and about training and all those hours. And, you know, I definitely feel like I'm better 14 years into practice than my very first cases that I did coming out of residency and fellowship. Um, and that's a very specialized skill set, but we're really trained in these, these mentorship, apprenticeship type programs. And they have standardization and they have certain core competencies, but they all vary. And then we vary. I, I vary from another surgeon in Des Moines who's doing the same procedure. And 
I, I have to appreciate that however, you know, special I think I am, I, I'm a big variable part of this, this treatment engine. And so things like robotics that can make things more standardized and more uniform uh, have some benefit there. You have to see that as having a benefit to the system and a potential benefit to patients. Now, figuring out what they should do and how well they do it and that technology evolving is a is a process. Got it. Got it. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I think that no matter what, like it, for, I can't think of a single technology that has like 100% adoption at, in orthopedic surgery or really any part of medicine. I don't know. I could be wrong about that. Uh, and I think that like, it's really going to be focused on Tailor, tailoring the approach based on the patient again like i'm a robotics guy but does every patient need to be you know need to be a robotic case probably not you know for you i mean you and your practice i know that you focus a lot on joints you you do a lot of hips i believe but like what's the like bread and butter of your practice is it mainly hips or is it is it another joint uh no it, it's knee and hip replacement i'm i'm exclusively uh, implant arthroplasty of the knee and hip. So er every procedure I do essentially is, is putting in a joint replacement. Uh, probably uh, skews much more, not much, uh, substantially more knees than hips. Um, and that, that follows the national trend. I want to say we're at like 1.2 million primary knees a year, hips maybe seven eight hundred thousand a year. So so most joint replacement surgeons it does skew a little bit more knee, and, and mine is is that number and more so for for whatever reason it's just evolved that way. Got it. By the way, like you know, I think you, for context, you you're in a solo private practice or are you part of a group? Part of a group. Part of a group. How many people are in your group? Like are surgeons? Uh, I'm going to say 12 or 15 of us, of us that are operating still. Got it. You know, something I really appreciate is like, I, I always love, uh, when surgeons kind of bring their own flair and brand to the treatment, you know, process. And for you, you have, again, as a former, like, you know, wrestling fan, I love that you have the, uh, like WWF wrestling belt. And for your patients, you have like the joint replacement champ, you know, like I, I really love that, that idea. How'd that come about? we just have fun with it. I mean, some of it, you just, you just got to laugh and you got to enjoy it. It's a, uh, it's sort of taking a moment to celebrate with the patients. I think they, they enjoy that because they've, you know, they've a lot of times worked really hard for this great outcome, they've done the physical therapy. Um, and they, they just want a chance to, to thank you and to celebrate with you. And, and it's an educational piece too. I show a lot of things with patients because, you know, there was some data from the Arthritis Foundation a few years ago that we were doing knee replacement surgery on about 10% of the people that needed it or would potentially benefit from it. So that means of the of all those patients that we have, there's 10 times more of them that are out there that are scared, that are just worried that for whatever reason, they've got some kind of impediment to getting it done. So I think seeing real people, seeing them have a good experience, uh, seeing them get over pain and do better. It, it breaks down some of those barriers for them and makes it a little bit approachable. Uh, it Part of the, yeah, we have fun with it, but part of the intent is to be educational and to, to open up that dialogue with patients. Got it. You know, in terms of like being educational and then like opening a dialogue up, not only with patients, but the broader industry, I mean, you've really taken you know, you've really embraced this concept of like being a digital opinion leader. Um, and again, taking to LinkedIn to, you know, post cases, have discussions. Of course, you have your own brand and flair. By the way, one of the your, one of the funniest posts I've seen was, I don't know where you were, but there was a place, there was a, you took a photo in front of a place that's called like the, like no bone zone. And you said, why would such a place exist? It's probably most yeah. ortho humor posts I've seen in a long time. I absolutely love it. It's ortho dad jokes, right? I mean, that's this... exactly, that's it's ortho dad jokes. That's why, that's why I loved it so much. Not because it's an ortho joke. It's an ortho dad joke. Yeah. Oh, that's yes. Yeah. You know, what's yeah, another, well, you know, what's a, you know, the first ortho dad joke I ever heard. It was when I was in medical school and I met an orthopedic, uh, uh, surgeon. Um, and it was, a, it was an orthopedic surgeon and then uh, there's a, a urologist, right? It was like in, I, I, it was like, I forgot some, some lunch seminar or something. 
and I met, you know, one and he's, you know, he's like orthopedic surgeon and I'm like, oh, oh, nice to meet you. I'm like, oh, are you also an orthopedic surgeon? And then the orthopedic surgeon says about the urology He's like, no, no, he's, he's, an, he's the other kind of bone doctor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, you've got a lot of potential for jokes with those two subspecialties for sure. Oh, no, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, how, how have you used LinkedIn to see, you know what I love, by the way, I just, see so this, this is the part of my show that I love is like, I don't edit these things, but like, I love that I'm, I'm at home, my studio, but because I work from home every now and then my wife comes and, and gives me the lower voice because the baby's sleeping, but the show's on, I can't lower my voice. I'm talking about ortho stuff. Um, <laughs> so I what- hear a dog in the background here or whatever else. So you just hey roll with. I, I love it. I, I love it. Um, no, something I was going to ask is that like, uh, how have you used LinkedIn, uh, to enhance your practice, to get exposure to things like what, why do you, why even use LinkedIn? Pretty much all of my social media stuff has just been an evolution. I'm, you know, sort of this upper middle aged guy that, you know, social media was not part of what I grew up with. I didn't have personal accounts several years ago. I got a Twitter account. I don't know. It was just the easiest to sign up for or something um, and did that for a bit and would put stuff out there and still do. Uh, there's a great uh, hashtag ortho Twitter uh, group uh, that, you know, discusses things, shows cases. You get those short snarky little comments on, on everything orthopedic. Um, and then did some, some patient, some very patient facing things on Facebook, which obviously skews more local. And it was sort of like, okay, whatever I was saying, well, let me say it over here on LinkedIn too. And, you know, LinkedIn has, has grown. I mean, what I've known of it, it started years ago. This was going to be some place that you went to post your resume or something. And then it never really took off. And then it was just kind of this white space where people could do whatever. Nobody really knew what to do with it. And then COVID hit and, you know, everybody's home. And so now everybody's talking about stuff on there uh, and it really evolved. And so it was me putting out things that I was interested in, but also asking questions and, and that community grew and the potential to uh, crowdsource opinions from around the world, uh, from, you know, everything from relative experts or people who think they're experts to some of absolutely the most known and qualified people in the entire world that are on there. And you have these discussions in real time and and really hash some things out. The interaction's wonderful. I showed a case a few days ago within a day, 24,000 views on it, comments all over the place, just really great discussion that's I think enriching for me and hopefully for a lot of those people that are reading it. Yeah. And I think, you know, I tell people that between I'd say, so pot, I love podcasting. I think podcasting is kind of like the second Gutenberg revolution. First Gutenberg revolution was like printing books at scale. Like the first time people had education at, at scale changed the world. And you think about podcasting, um, it's the first time that people are able to learn while doing a second thing. So like, you know, for example, I, um, you know, I had a five hour drive the other day from Scottsdale, you know, like to and from Scottsdale, both times, like I listened to, um, you know, a book on from by Naval Ravikant or on Naval Ravikant, just on investing in wealth creation, and everything, you know, the, so it's almost like you're getting back time. And then with social media, you know, I'll use my father example. My father was a general surgeon for 30 years. Uh, solo private practice, like old school general surgeon, not an academia guy. He he was never, ever, ever going to be the guy who's going to stand up on podium at a conference. And then at least growing up, I don't remember my dad going to the American College of Surgeons very often, right? Just because he's busy with practice. And so the amount of exposure my dad could have had to like a lot of technology and everything was really limited. But now with social media, and you're a great example of that because like, and I'm going to bring up one of the posts that you had the other day that uh, was really interesting. You can crowdsource this in real time. And again, Ira Kirschenbaum's uh, Journal of Orthopedic Surgery, or Journal of Orthopedic Experience and Innovation, Joey is a great example of that, which is real time crowdsourced experienced procedures and showing like what's happening in real time versus waiting for it to be published in JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine a year or two later. 
right? How, how much do you think that's going to change the specialty of orthopedic surgery? It already is. It's changing the practice and it's changing the industry around it. And you touched a bunch of different points was so if your dad was, was an old school general surgeon, you know, like all of us, he's, he's at times had to sit in a lounge somewhere and, and drink, you know, old coffee, uh, and wait around for a case. Yeah. Well, may, maybe there was a library there. Maybe there wasn't, but you weren't going to leave the OR. But, you know, somebody can pick up their phone now and be learning. Exactly. Be learning from colleagues on LinkedIn, you can, your, your time shifted. You can get some of that time back because of those same things you described with podcasting. And so there's a chance for that and a chance to be exposed to a lot more things. And then it's sort of the, maybe the recognition that, some of some of the people on the podium are absolutely from a, 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 let's say an orthopedic surgery, but some of those people on the podium are absolutely you know hands down the best in the world. They're they're the opinion leaders on something, and and some of them don't operate much, and they spend a lot of time reading and writing. And doesn't mean that they don't have a lot that's valuable to contribute, but it does mean that there are people like me that are out you know, in private practice in the trenches and, you know, doing seven, 800 joint replacement cases a year. And so there's a lot of practical wisdom, I think, that we can contribute. And there's also a lot of shared experience because there are a lot more people like me out there trying to get this done every day and, and serve their patients uh, than there necessarily are in, in some of the, the bigger academic centers. And so, the ability to share some of those common experiences and, and common things that can can really help them in a real world day to day setting, I think, has a lot of value. And then the crossover, as you said, with that digital opinion leadership is that for industry, they're no longer reliant on having a meeting, having to physically get someone present at a dinner, at a meeting, at somewhere to hear their expert or hear about their product when, you know, I, I if I talk about something, 8,000 people are going to see it online mm -hmm. tonight. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, because so uh, I grew up back in the day where there was no uh, vendor credentialing. I remember the, the, a time when I was like 16, 17 years old, where I was just like waltz into the hospital literally go back to the to the OR, talk to the circulating nurse and be like, hey, you know, I'm I'm Mazin's son. I'm I'm gonna go hang out in the OR. And it's like, oh yeah, great. Just grab some scrums. I just walk in, right? But in those times, like in between cases, I distinctly remember like you we would go and sit in the doctor's lounge. Um back then there was still old coffee. But you know, there was nothing else to do except like watch TV. It's a ESPN or like the usually the CNN or Fox or on. CNBC on the TV and <laughs> Somebody's telling you about some terrible investment that they're trying to lure you, you know. You know, so I feel like every, every, that's that every surgeon's lounge has that one physician who's just, who's, who's talking about some random investment. And it's just like, I'm just going to, I'm going to do yeah. the PSA right now for it. On rare occasion, will there be a physician who's like, so good that on their spare time, they're going to beat all the other people who are focused on, let's just say like real estate wow. investing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're not yeah, going to beat those don't, people. Don't listen to that, that guy. <laughs> yeah. Or, or gal in that case. Or gal. Yeah. Ga guy yeah. or gal. Yeah. But you know, yeah, there's always that, there's always that person. But yeah, to your point, like what I love and, and, and again, like I, I have, I have the data in front of me here. I could, I could just like pull, pull it up just as an example. So like every, we'll go look at orthopedic surgeons. So like every month I'm tracking the amount of activity by specialties on LinkedIn. So if you look at orthopedic surgeons, right? Let's just look at the United States. There's about 41,000 orthopedic surgeon profiles on LinkedIn. Okay. And that's that, those are the ones who listed orthopedic surgery, right? It's 41,000. Of that 41,000, 3,000 of them in the U.S., created their own content, which is about 7%. The reason why that's like extreme, like very significant. If you look, took it all, if you look, took it, took all of LinkedIn, which is about 950 million users, less than 1% of those users create content. And so with yeah. orthopedic surgeons, they're almost seven times more likely than the link average LinkedIn user to be creating content. Right. And I, and I, and I mean, I look at your posts, I look at Moby Parsons, uh, 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 Dr. Claps, Ira Krishnabam, like 
they're deep, deep, long clinical discussions. And the, the, the great thing about these things is that it's, it's all there. Like I've learned more from those posts and those common threads than my orthopedic uh, section in medical school, but they're kind of ongoing, right? Versus like, I think at a conference, you can have a great discussion on podium, but kind of like starts and ends there and not everybody can chime in. Yeah, it's very interactive. So you, you get a lot of chance for people to jump in. And I, I really feel like it's a great community. And I think the, not all, but the majority of, of the people on there are doing that with a really good intent. They're trying to learn. They're open minded. They're, they're not trying to be dogmatic about something. They're making the point that they have to make, but they're really having a very civilized discussion. So you get some people that, you know, they're there to plug some all the time and you know what they're going to say. And that's okay too. Uh, I think people kind of learn to filter that out, but the people that are, that are coming at it with, with really pure intent and with curiosity, um, I think they do well. And I think we have some, some awesome discussions because of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's kind of a good segue. I want to bring up a post of yours and I'm going to try and share. Uh, yeah, I can share my screen. So I'm going to share a screen for those who are on Spotify and YouTube. You'll be able to see this. If you're not, sorry, you have to go on those platforms. So you had this post. I'm going to read this just for the audience who's, who can't see this. So you, you start off by saying real world controversy. At this point, there's compelling ev evidence that cemented hip stems reduce the incidence of periprosthetic fractures when treating femoral neck fractures with implant arthroplasty. Side note, if you ever want to test if somebody really is in this field and know, like at least has experience, have them read a sentence like that without like fumbling over <laughs> their words. I should get an award for that. Um, <laughs> there, there is some but less evidence in support of both pro prophylactic cabling and use of collared cementless stems. Despite this, many of us still routinely, routinely use cementless implants. My question is why? Are we being lazy? Do we perhaps arrogantly believe that with good technique in the hands of a high volume arthroplasty surgeon that the risks aren't there? Are we the ones who get tasked with reconstructing, uh, with reconstructing the ones that do fracture and we find them to be more complicated and, and complication ridden? What would you do or what do you do and why? And so if I scroll down and, and take a look at, at the comms and actually, uh, we will, yeah, we'll do the most relevant, you know, so there's, there's a lot of really good comments here, like pair, like Moby Parsons has like, uh, or not Moby Parsons, Dr. Uh, Blackmer has like three paragraphs in there. And there's a lot of like really big names just in this comment thread. So yeah. my, my first question to you is like, what, what was your main takeaway from this post? Like, did it change your mind about, about this, about this technique? And like, what, what, what did you learn from, from the comments on this? Um, you know, I, I come, I come in uh, to a lot of this with, with pretty strong opinions. And I, I say that I, I have strong opinions that are loosely held. I, I'm always willing to change my mind for a better, better answer. Um, but what we have to appreciate is that science is particular to a particular situation. So if we have papers published on something, what they tell you is what happened in that set of circumstances. And it should be reproducible under that exact set of circumstances. We can infer things about it. We can try to extrapolate it to other things, but it, it's a very specific set of circumstances. And then other people will trial things that will be similar. And, and we're looking for these commonalities, but there, there are a lot of bigger questions about what's important in general, what are the nuances that we may be missing? So if I say, okay, if I do a cemented hip stem every time for a femoral neck fracture, from most of the studies that we have, statistically, statistically we can say, I'm going to have fewer periprosthetic fractures post-op. But okay, when they looked at that, was that always in the hands of high volume arthroplasty surgeons? Was that over a big group with people that may treat these kind of problems 12 times a year or not very often? Um, and then even if we've decided that, okay, that does produce fewer periprosthetic fractures, what are then the complications of those and how much more difficult are they to reconstruct or not difficult to reconstruct based on the fact that cement was or was not used. 
And so we're, we're having to make decisions for people and we're having to think about their future. And sometimes we're having to think two or three operations ahead uh, because when we do these things, you know, everything has its nuances, but this is not like taking out an appendix. We're, we're putting in these artificial parts that are, are going to be there henceforth. And so there will be downstream consequences for everything that we do. And we've got to try to think about those. And I'm, I'm looking for answers. I'm looking for who's got an interesting thought about this. That's going to make me, you know, turn the wheels and and reevaluate what I'm doing uh, every time I do that. And I'm hopefully putting some things out that are going to, going to help other people sort of calibrate what they do based on what's out there. Yeah. And, and like, again, what, what gets me most excited is, you know, behind me for people who don't see, I mean, I have, I have a lot of books behind me. Like one of the books that are areas of books that I study all is, is the influence of technology and these channels on society and like how we do things. And we're, even though it may not feel like it, we're still in the very early stages of LinkedIn and the influence of it on medical education, right? You have Joey, you have people like you posting and we're just scratching the surface. So like at scale, what does this look like? And this is, this is, we're, you know, we're not at ground zero, but we're still early days of, of the internet. This is exactly what you said. I mean, this is, this is the printing press. This is yeah. democratization of information and we're, we're, we're in, in the early stages of it for 100- sure. A hundred percent. And like, you know, here's, here's what gets me excited is that if you talk to anybody in the med tech industry, so if you go to talk to the early class from intuitive surgical or Covidian, for example, or any of these big billion dollar unicorn stories, right? Everybody has the same story, which is what, what drove the adoption of a new technology and proliferation of it was never somebody who was chair of, I don't know, Hopkins or Mass General thing. Those, those places did have like very big influences, but most of the time, what really was the first domino in the stages of, of adoption was a physician like yourself, who's not part of a huge academic institution, but just does a lot of volume and is usually, I don't know why, it's like never been, I've, I'm still looking for one surgeon who's like comes from a big metropolitan area. It's always somebody who's not in a big, huge city who just does a lot of volume. And it's like never on somebody's like scorecard of like, oh yeah, the, I, I predicted that to happen, you know? And I think that these technologies like LinkedIn raises awareness and helps drive that adoption so much faster. Because in the past, you literally just, it was pure luck going to conferences and talking to people that that person would find your technology. And now you can just do it at scale on LinkedIn. Have you have you personally adopted any new devices, implants, et cetera, just from getting exposure to them on LinkedIn? Yeah, all, all the time. And, and, you know, people, you know, will direct message me on LinkedIn, which is fine too, and, and you know, pitch me on certain stuff. But it's, it's more of things that just get on your radar. Hmm. And then you meet people or see those later in real life. It builds over over time it's just exposure to it because otherwise people uh get in some very narrow uh silos and they just miss out on some of these things and even if you're going to national meetings even if you're going to uh the american academy of orthopedic surgeons or AUKUS every couple of years or you're 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 here and there those meetings are giant now like it's really hard to i mean look i, I don't even attend get out and cover everything on, no, on the floor. You can't. Exhibit. Look, even if you could walk by it, there's not the bandwidth to try to absorb and think about any of that unless you just did it every day the meeting was open. You did nothing but walk through that exhibit hall and try to talk to everybody. A hundred percent. I mean, even me, I mean, look, I went to double AOS just because Ira, Ira was throwing a awesome Joey party, which by the way, that was like, yeah. that was a, that, that Joey Ira, if you're listening, that Joey party you threw was so damn good. Not just because of the location, it was a lot of fun, but it was like a who's who of like ortho social media. Like all, everybody was there. It was a blast. Well, and look at what, I mean, this is just another example of the same sort of thing. I mean, obviously what Ira's done with with Joey is incredible. I'm an editorial uh, reviewer. He's awesome, Uh, has a a great mind and a a great heart for orthopedics. Um, But he's removed so many barriers, you know? So what you see in Joey is peer reviewed, but it, it's, 
it's there's not it's not a pay to publish thing. There's not all these barriers of cost or of you're not from the right center. There there's not all of these heavy political things. He's just reduced that barrier to entry and let people get those ideas out there. They're peer reviewed. Um, and then once once they're out there, the market, so to speak, uh, gets to decide their value. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think that, again, that's that's the really interesting thing about this. And again, I would say just like from an industry standpoint, uh, the you know, before like when I when I. I've been in this game a, a long time, at least in terms of like social media years. But I remember when I was really trying to drive not just adoption, but like leverage case studies for social media early. Like we're talking about 2014, like it was hard back then. Now, you know, you Ooh. have more adoption online. And so like you could be per, like in some of the startups I was at, smaller company. Like when I was at Petrero Medical and we raised, we didn't have a lot of money back then. We couldn't attend conferences. We leverage social so much that it really drove adoption and awareness of the product, right? And I think that's the sure. exciting thing because like so many great companies, med tech companies in the past, never made it to market, not because they couldn't get through the FDA, not because they didn't have a great technology. It's just that they couldn't hit a certain inflection point to raise the next round and survive. And now I think with social, like you can technically get a pipeline of potential adopters and in interested hospitals before you even like physically set foot, you know, hundred percent. So and you can, you can get exposure sets the table for, for subsequent conversations about that. So on that note, like what, what are some current technologies that have kind of come on your radar from, I mean, it doesn't have to be from LinkedIn, but just what, what are some, what are some new technologies that, and you could feel free to like plug companies or anything. That's totally okay on this show. What's what's kind of come to come to your come come across your desk or your screen, I guess, in this in this case, that you're like, oh man, that's really exciting. Whether you've used it or not, um, it's 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 a lot of things. I mean, so when you look at the big players, you know, these huge multi billion dollar companies, you're seeing um, AI, you're seeing AR uh, uh, mixed reality. Do you, do you like do you like the use of AR as a surgeon? Because I I've heard mixed reviews. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, with, without, and I think that's absolutely fair. I, I think that is early, early days. Um, I'm not gonna gonna plug anybody's stuff specifically, but I've I've looked at some things in the past that were clunky and cumbersome, and I'm like, you, you've you've taken navigation, computer navigation, and and given it a different visual and made it really cumbersome and expensive. And, and this is probably not going anywhere, but I, I put on some stuff within the last year where, where patient anatomy was projected three dimensionally over the patient and, and the opportunity to, to see through them and see where the bones are um, and see where a potential implant is going. And, and I said, Oh, okay. All right, we're we're getting somewhere. So I, I think, yeah, I think that is going to turn out to be uh, a really cool and interesting thing. Um, patient specific stuff, uh, still very cool. I'm, I'm I'm hot on that, obviously, and the ability to do that. So maybe too, like what we talked about with the taking what was historically had to be with three dimensional imaging and doing it with X ray. So taking something that we liked and making it much more streamlined where we don't have to expose the patient to as much radiation. We don't have to go through an insurance uh, uh, company to get a CT scan approved. So you've got some, some things like that. And then there's, there's just all kind of uh, little, little niche things um, out there on the sort of supplemental pharma side, uh, CBD uh, products. Mm. I've dealt with, uh, with some companies that do that. Um, where we we've, we've interacted initially online uh, that have that have led to some more meaningful discussions on on things like that and some other um, items that kind of get added so it's everything from the the really big to the to the really small and and you get a chance to to see them all and some people may not want to see them all or see them as often I'm I'm geeky about this stuff so I'll I'll look at it a, a lot of the time and I want to know what's out there in that that ecosystem and what's available to me and some of it I, I don't adopt right away but it's you know it's sitting back there it's in a corner of my mind somewhere and you know I've come back to things 
18 months, two years after I've seen them, tried them. What make what makes you kind of come back to something like, let's say, a year or two later? Like, it, at least it'll, it'll if you keep, go... It'll keep coming up or, you know, I'll, I'll see it and not see a need. And then I see the need later or I see, you know, some something kind of kicks loose to, to make me realize the utility or the potential utility. Have you ever, as a surgeon... <clears throat> Have you been wrong about a technology in the past where you saw something you're like, no, that'll ne never take off. It's probably, there's not probably much need. And then like over time, the technology matured and you're like, oh, I was wrong about that. Is there anything that comes to mind like that? I, I haven't seen it yet. And part of that I think has to do with how slowly we adopt things in medicine and justifiably so, because there's a, uh, there's a requirement of, of absolute safety with mm -hmm. what we do. Uh, so things get incorporated, like, you know, you want a robot, you want an AI, it, it makes widgets, it makes 90, 95% of them really accurately, and we have to throw 5% of them away. That's no big deal. You do that, we're taking care of humans and it, it's a disaster. You can't do that. It has to yeah. be as good and, and better than what we're doing already. And it has to be maximally safe. So uh, I've, I've seen a few things and, you know, robotics has been the hot thing over the last five and gosh, almost 10 years now, it feels like, um, that has so far, you know, I, for all the buzz, it hasn't materialized into, to everything that, that maybe it was going to, uh, but I still think it I, will. Agree. I, I still believe in, in that as a very big picture concept. Um, and we'll see. I mean, I, I'm, you know, what's, what's the next big thing that's going to change the game for our patients? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree on the robotics side. I mean, look, like Intuitive has been around for almost two decades now. We have a lot of different technologies or robotic platforms that come out. And if you, depending on how you slice it, you know, if you look at robotics across like all surgery, the adoption rate is like at less than 3%. And then if you base it based on spe specialty, I think the very highest, which might be orthopedics, um, there's maybe like 12, 13% adoption. It's, it's just like, you know, I think that's part, the part of the reason why is that a lot of robotics, healthcare has become more expensive and we're not living in the time where like, like when my dad was practicing, where it's just like surgeon can just adopt technology and hospital will pay for it. Like it's really got to make like a traumatic, not tra traumatic, a dramatic improvement for outcomes in patient care, not to mention the economic side, the efficacy, all these different things. Yeah, right. It's got to be better, faster, and cheaper all at once. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. It's a tough thing. And I think I kind of took your question in reverse. Of, of you were kind of asking what I what I had slept on that that turned into a big thing. Um, I have to think about that. I, I don't know of anything right off the top. Yeah, no, I don't think. I mean, I think mainly because like things have to be like really like they're a little bit slower. So it's kind of like I don't know if that's a if that's how yeah. you know because like you have time to kind of react you know like i mean there at least in my world like especially on the software side there are things that i was like pretty wrong about and i was like ah, oh, i was pretty wrong about that i will make a controversial statement though about something even though like i mean i so i i have a lot of i, I should talk about this more i have a SaaS company called omnicrater which is a platform for uh housing, creating and automating content for LinkedIn. And we've actually used the chat GPT, uh, API in there, which I do love chat GPT. I think chat GPT is like an idiot savant. Like it's, it's a savant or a genius when it comes to certain things. And you're like, man, this thing is impressive, but it's, it's an idiot. And other things like think about like a person, an idiot savant, right? Genius. Yep next level genius for certain things but like it's like hey can you go and like uh i don't know have a conversation with some people and it's just like idiot right i feel like chat gpt is like that you know because like i'll talk i'll talk to chat gpt and have a conversation about something some sides i'm like this thing is unbelievable like i i, I think i had it yeah. um write up uh, uh an essay to, to explain like technology adoption using like a few physics formulas in medicine brilliant i was i was like damn that's really impressive then i asked it to do like some copywriting for something and i'm like and i tried to go back i'm like chat gpt this is i'm, I'm gonna yeah. take it from here man i'm gonna take it from here you take it <laughs> yeah. well it's and so i guess getting well I, going back things that i i think when i saw the very few people in the country 
when I was a resident and I'd be at a conference that were talking about outpatient joint replacement. And it was so different from what I was seeing. Oh, and that, know, we're talking it, about a couple of decades ago. That that must have been wild yeah. to hear. Like, you're like, there's no way they're doing outpatient joint oh, replacement. Well, I mean, why would you want to? I mean, you just do it in the hospital. They just stay a few days. And, and now, you know, me and everybody else, I mean, same day, outpatient, total hip, total knee, all the time. Super, super common. <laughs> I, um, but but getting back, I think I think there's two things about that, and, and it goes back to some of the other things that we've talked about. Is is Chat GPT is early early days. This is this is AI just starting to become AI. You know, and mm-hmm. if, you, if you listen to you know, I think Ray Kurzweil and some people like that that have oh, yeah. consist- predicted AI at a at a human level intelligence, whatever that means by 2029, you know, so we're, we're just seeing just the the tip of what this iceberg is going to be. And that technology, like all technologies, doesn't develop linearly. The technology that is going to be developed four years from now, we can't even fathom because we need the technology that's developed 18 months from now in order to develop that set of technology that's the next step down the road. Um, and and it, it, it's a, it's a multiple and not a linear progression. Oh no, yeah, no, hundred percent. And I think that's, that's, a, that's kind of the exciting thing is like, so again, that's why for me, I was very bullish not to, you know, keep going back to it, but there's a reason why, like, I mean, I literally started a company on this thesis that surgeons and physicians using LinkedIn, like this is the next thing, because think about how it accelerates adoption, how, how it changes minds, education, all these different things, you know, by the way, the, just, just like a quick sidebar, the um, chat GPT situation is really interesting. So, you know, do you know how, who first, who technically like was one of the main like investors in chat GPT? No idea. Okay. So, so this is interesting. So main investor in chat GPT, I think like 50 or $60 million was Elon Musk. Okay. Oh. And, and originally chat GPT was a nonprofit, you know? Okay. Mm-hmm. Cause his thing was like, you know, we have to be really careful with AI. If it has like certain corporate interests, like it, it could get out of control. It's just not good. Right. You know, it's, it, it, it has a bias. Like if you think about AI, the way it's trained, AI essentially is trained by data that humans feed it. Right. Yeah. And then, um, he was talking about it cause he's pretty pissed off about it. Cause like they've, they now have a, bi- a business model. They charge 20 bucks a month and stuff. And so he's really pissed off about that because he's like, he's like, I don't know if that's legal or not. Because like, I, I, I came up with a name, I gave them money and it, and he, and he, the analogy he came up with is like, it's kind of like if you are really passionate about saving the rainforest and you like fund a company that's a nonprofit to save the rainforest. And then like a few years later, the company decides to go pro- for profit and become like a lumber company and chop down the rainforest. And I'm like, you know, that's a, it's actually a really good analogy. So like, it's going to be interesting to see, like, in terms of the evolution of a new market, we're at the very beginning of a new market, which is generative AI. So you have chat GPT, you have Bard from Google, you have uh, Microsoft as, I guess, partner chat GPT. So it'll take maybe five to 10 years to see who is going to be like the category king at the end of it, you know? So like, if you look at electric cars 10 years ago, there's Toyota, there's Tesla, etc. Fast forward 10 years, it's Tesla who's kind of owned the market. Um, So it'll be interesting to see who owns that market, like for generative AI in the future. I'm sure the other thing is like the partnerships with like Epic and, 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 and EMRs is going to be interesting. Oh, yeah. You know, how do, how do EMRs make you feel as a surgeon? That just says all, that says it all. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) EMRs were, were, were designed to harvest information for billing. Um, It's not about patient care, um, you know. So it is what it is. It's never in my mind, you know, the the goal, right? The big idea would be that there's something in the cloud or somewhere where we have patients records or, you know, we can have some sort of electronic clearinghouse that just based on CPT codes or something, we know what surgeries they've had in the past or what they've been treated for. And it really is portable and accessible and it has information that's meaningful for clinicians, but it, it spits out pages and pages of garbage that are, are there for billing. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Uh, yeah. 
And you know, I, I'm obviously a little, a little jaded. Maybe. What, what, what? No, I think a lot of people are. I mean, look, I think there's a reason why like physician burnout is is on the rise, and like I don't know, physicians commit suicide like what ten or twenty x more than the average population, and it's not because I haven't. You know, I'll tell you what, I've met a lot of physicians, and not just in my career, but even as a kid. I never met a single physician who's like, man, I hate dealing with patients. Everybody loves dealing with patients. Everybody loves the practice of medicine. It's it's really the administrative side of medicine that's out of control and have physicians burned out and hating it. You know, uh, I definitely see that. And there are there are patient interactions that can be very draining. Uh, medicine just takes a lot from you emotionally, physically, uh, time wise and in a lot of ways. But it gives a lot in terms of, of psychological satisfaction. And um, I'm trying to remember, I think Malcolm Gladwell's written about this and, you know, if the three things you need for meaningful work and it's, um, you know, complexity, I mean, good Lord, I mean, medicine's got that covered. I mean, what could possibly be more complex? Um, but the other is, is, you know, the autonomy and the ability to have your, your outcomes or your rewards tied to what you do in terms of effort. And, and that's the part where it's really breaking down as you're seeing uh, physicians that don't have a lot of autonomy um, and they don't have their, their personal fortunes tied to what's going on. And I, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm in private practice in the best subspecialty you could be in. Uh, I have a lot of control of my life practice that I work with is affiliated with a private hospital, like private, like owned by a family, like nice mm. people, like everything doesn't, you know, I, I, I can be at odds with the hospital, but ultimately things don't wind through eight layers of committees. Like I know somebody in purchasing that I can send an email or a text to, I know the CEO, I know the ownership, like I'm in like the most perfect situation and it, it's still, uh, you know, it still can be very demanding. So you've got people in situations where they, they very much feel like a, a cog in a wheel and often they are being exploited by, um, you know, the corporate medicine machine. Yeah. What, this this is a little controversial, but um, <laughs> I uh, how do you feel about private equity moving into medicine? Because they love orthopedic surgery, and that's been actually Joey's yeah. most engaged article was a private equity article. What's what's your take on that? Yeah, I'm I'm waiting to see. Um, oh you know, come on, man! You can't. No, no, no. Can't. no I, like, <laughs> like, so my so my group has not not taken any kind of private equity money. I mean, so look back. I mean. Before before the word private equity, these these used to be called leverage buyout firms, mm. um, and and that's what they do. And, and private equity is a is a nicer name for it. I, I don't know that they're necessarily creating value. They're definitely acquiring and packaging practices and companies in a way that they can be resold and. We don't have enough experience yet uh, to know fully what happens with that. Um, I see, you know, right now orthopedics is hot, but probably where they've they've done a lot in previous years, uh, dentistry, uh, dermatology, pain management, some things like that. Um, I have seen a pain management patient, um, a mutual patient that was also at a, a, a corporate uh, pain management practice on on my exam table. They spread out this list of cards for five appointments over like a six week period. Ones to refill the medication. Ones to get a shot in one body part. Ones to get a shot in another body part. Ones it keeps going, and I'm like, so you're going and paying for a visit and a copay and a procedure for each one of these visits over six weeks, that, that doesn't happen in a private practice setting. That, that, that patient as a customer would push back and, and say to this doctor who owned like, uh, what are you doing? Can't you help me? Like, I don't want to, but there's a, to make this work, there has to be a lot of upsell of, of services and, and, you know, there's, there's, I jumped into a controversial story there to, to make a point, but, um, 
it, it, it also is a pushback against you know, hospital owned practices, which have their downsides too. It's, it's sure. people trying to take on another partner to avoid the loss of control to a hospital system. So there, there's two, two sides to it. And we haven't, we haven't seen it play out far enough in orthopedics, I think to know yet. Yeah. And I don't know. I, what I think is interesting is seeing like alternative. I mean, look, if we can, if we see alternative models for funding in the world of startups right now, like you, you, you know, there are ways to get funded through initial coin offerings and crypto. There's equity crowdfunding. There's there's multiple ways getting funded directly from family offices. Then I feel like there's high high potential to see that same kind of innovation on the finance side come to medicine because I already see. I mean, look, there are spine surgeons I know that are just. Uh, cash only, right? There is an orthopedic surgeon, uh, you you probably know of him, Dr. Daniel Paul, who not only is uh, cash only, but he's a mobile orthopedic surgeon, cash only, which yeah, by the way, a lot of podcasts, great Yeah, guy, he's great. Great, great, great model. And there, there, are, there are joint replacement surgeons that are, that are going um, all cash or they don't take Medicare. And as commercial insurance and, and Medicare and and all these things get realistically, they get a little bit more ridiculous every year. Yeah, um, no, while, seriously, seriously, you know, it's they're, they're providing less service, and patients have fewer and fewer things covered. Right, well, and they're and, and they're paying they pay, doctors less. You know, well, take 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 even the doctors out. But if you're on the patient side of this, you're paying more and more every year, and it covers less and less. And you've got a five thousand dollar or ten thousand dollar deductible. Well, we long ago passed the break point where it's it's cheaper to just pay for your primary care out of pocket. I mean, if you're even close to healthy, a good internist with basic lab test, generic medications, they can take care of a ton of stuff for you uh, for, for much less than what you're spending for commercial insurance. And that's been um, the rise of, you know, what initially was called concierge medicine that was intended to be, you know, fancy and for the super wealthy that now is just direct patient care. Uh, yeah. I, and I mean, it, it's, it, it's, we're getting to the point that that's becoming affordable for specialty care. Yeah. Well, and you know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw myself in there. Like I'm not sitting on like $50 million, but there are certain, you know, I have insurance, but there are certain things where Either it takes a lot, like it'll take me, like, you know, what was it? What did I pay out of pocket for the other day? I think I was to see a cardiologist just for like a, a like a regular checkup. And the one that I was going to go see was taking like three or four months. And so I just called the one that I wanted to go see. And I'm like, what if I pay cash? And they're like, well, we can take you to like this week. I'm like, great, I'll do that. Right. Yep. <laughs> like, I don't care. You know, and so I think there's plenty of people who are just like, like, you know, I have insurance, but like, I'm going to, I got to wait four months. You know, like for, you know, and, and so same thing. I mean, like I saw my dentist friend, um, I don't know, a year or two ago, knee pain. Uh, okay. Listen, I, I really think you've got a meniscus tear. You probably need an MRI. Uh, I mean, we can file it through insurance. They can pay the copay for that. We're waiting on pre-authorization, all this stuff. He's like, uh, what if I just pay for this and, you know, cash pay, MRI is done, boom, ready to go. He's like, I, I got stuff to do. Like I'm, yeah. I'm trying to work. I'm trying to do things like I can't wait around on all this. And for, I mean, between what he got that for just paying directly and what he would have paid as the deductible or copay part, nothing. Yeah. And so as we're, we're speaking to a lot of specific instances, but generally as this commercial insurance market gets more and more ridiculous all the time, other models get more and more plausible and possible. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see. I try not too much. I try not to think about that side of medicine too much. I, I just really enjoy the innovation side, you know, but you know, that does, I don't know. And again, like, I mean, <laughs> kind of like full circle, like this is why, like, uh, you know, I get excited seeing these, these communities, like the orthopedic community on LinkedIn. Cause like had, had there not been a community on LinkedIn, I would have never found out about a Daniel Paul who's literally running a 
cash-based mobile, like for people, mobile orthopedic practice. It's wild, right. you know, wild. Yeah. And, and again, like people, whenever, when people hear cash based, they think like, oh, this is a doc, this is a surgeon that only like deals with like super wealthy patients. Most of his patients are like middle class patients and he doesn't operate all the time, you know? So there's like a lot of different ways for him to run a practice. And, you know, he put it best, he, he came on my podcast as well. You know, is he, will he make, um, you know, well into the seven figures? Maybe, maybe not, but he lives a much better quality of life because professionally well, he's not bound by anything. He, he, he gets to take, and his, his, his real reasoning for this was like to really focus on patient care, spend more time with patients and get them the care that they need. You know, an amazing idea, right? Yeah. Look, I, I'll, it, I'll tell you what, man, that takes some like serious cojones on that guy to do it because he, it's not like he was like five, 10, 15 years into practice, decided to do this. He, the guy literally finished fellowship and was like interviewing around and was like, yeah, all these people who I'm interviewing with, they all look miserable and they're kind of jerks. I don't want to be like that. I think I'm just going to do my own thing. That's like, yeah. I, I don't think that guy gets enough credit for like how, how brave that was, you know? For sure. he, he's, he's a renegade and, and he's, he's the very first wave. I mean, when this starts happening at a bigger scale, you know, people will be able to point back and say, oh, yeah, I mean, he was he was thinking this back then. Yeah. And I'm I'm kind of curious to see, like, um, just on the in innovation side, like like innovation around business models. So, you know, the the classic business model in med tech is like the razor razor blade model. Sell the razor, you know, make money off the razor blades over time. So at least that's very much the robotics model. And, uh, you know, hospitals aren't stupid. <laughs> you know, they have pretty right. like HCA and tenant uh, and all these other uh, hospitals have pretty savvy purchasing departments. And so like, there's a lot of interesting innovations on the business model side, like including not just like lease to own, but like capital equipment deals where they're, where they're like, Hey, we will like, if you sign a contract to use our implants or use this or that, we will rent out the piece of capital. We won't even charge you for it. You know? So there's like a lot of interesting business models coming about, you know? Yeah, um, it, it really is. And that, that's almost too hard to keep up with. I mean, certainly the early days of robotics, you know, Stryker got there first, I mean, realistically. Um, and when they, you know, acquired Mako, that was $1.7 billion. So there were, they were still selling those, those robots at seven figure capital purchases to hospitals and ASCs when they rolled that out. And I'm, relatively certain they're not doing that now. And certainly a lot of their competitors uh, with other robots are, are doing similar deals and are trying to, you know, to get more volume. Everybody's got downward pressure on their implant pricing as well as their disposables. And they're looking for ways and looking to diversify and we'll, we'll be right. the financing for your surgery center. We'll, we'll do whatever else you need. We'll get into as many businesses as we have. And, um, there's enough, there's so on the arthroplasty side, there's so much volume growth, you know, that's still going to happen over the next decade or two, uh, because of, of the baby boomers and just the demand generally, um, that they're able to, um, grow volume, even some of them that are, you know, on a percentage basis, maybe losing some traction in terms of market share are still growing their overall volume because there's so many of these things to be done and they're, they're holding it together that way. But you're going to see more and more of those creative models. Yeah. You know, by the way, like super random factoid, because uh, so I had uh striker president, Jim Heath uh, on my show and we talked about like Stryker's acquisition and make all these, you know, Stryker went through some hard times post economic crash in 08. You want to know what, what's wild? I asked him, I was like, you know, during the boom years, like I think it was like 2011 to 16, 17, when like Stryker really like leveled up and everything. I asked him, I was like, so was Mako the thing that really leveled up Stryker revenue wise and everything? It's not. You know, what it was was a waste management uh, service or product that Stryker had. Isn't that wild? Yeah. It's like such a Warren Buffett like style business. Like, no, it wasn't, it wasn't the robot. It was just like waste management product that we have. <laughs> Amazing. I, I love it. I love it. So, Dr. Barber, just like with our time left, again, I appreciate you coming on the show. You're definitely going to be a repeat guest. So, I want to do a little bit of rapid fire question. Okay. But we're going to focus this more on the med tech side. Okay. okay. Some of these you may not want to answer. And I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you I that just opportunity. Say pass. Is it you like can just a say pass. Okay. Yeah, you can say pass. Okay. But 
you will, you will get heat. You might get some heat on LinkedIn for passing on it because my audience usually is pretty vocal about it. Okay, so here we go. Lightning round. Okay. I'm scared. Uh, we should have done this early on when I was fresh. I know. That's what I had to wear you down. So now it's just okay. going to be lit It's really just going to be like what comes to mind. Okay. All right. So uh, name the med tech company you feel has the coolest company culture. Uh, depends on coolest. And I guess it depends on who you interact with uh, the most. Um, I'm, I'm biased because I do some work with them. Um, yeah, that's okay. The, guy, the guys at United have been awesome. Um, a little different because this is a, you know, a company that's big in the UK and in Asia that has a very small footprint here. Uh, but they've been awesome to work with. Um, ortho development, um, another kind of mid tier, uh, smaller one. I use a lot of their implants. Um, absolutely, uh, delightful people to work with. Uh, everything is nice. Everything is as promised, um, in some ways. Uh, very boring, but but not not trying to sell you flash. Everything is is legit um, and and follows up. Nice. Okay. Uh, you're on a does you're on an island performing surgery for a full year, right? Um, you have to pick one company implant to use the whole year round. What do you pick? Oh, I know this is a bad. It's a con. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. That that that's so. I, I'm like the absolute wrong person to ask this question because a lot of people pick something and they do it 95 percent of the time i love knowing what's out there um and and who's got all these great niche products and i work with an independent rep so i have the opportunity to bring them all in and pick the best of the best and, and kind of curate these these great things for my patients you know, unfortunately, if I've got to pick one to use all year, it, it's going to be, it's going to, I'm not, no, I'm not going to say it, but it's going to oh. be one of the, big, it's going to be one of the big four. Um, okay. All right. That's fair. It, yeah, yeah. They don't need the press. I, and, mm, you um, got it. Okay. That's it's going to be one of the big four. It's going to be who's got that really deep product catalog with all the, the, the most uh, niche things to cover all the bases. Okay. Got it. Got it. When you go to, uh, to double AOS, uh, who do you feel always has not, and this doesn't mean that you use their products. It just means that you're impressed with their booth. Who is, who's always got the most impressive like booth. Oh, um, and I'll answer man. this with you too, because booth booths are like my thing. So I'll let you go first, but I'll, I'll take well, the so, heat off. So, so you may, you may have a better opinion, right? I mean, the, again, it's the multi-billion dollar giants, right? Of um, course, of course. It's the, the strikers, the Smith nephews. Arthrex is always really flashy looking. I don't even do sports medicine, but their stuff looks cool. Uh, it's it's going to be uh, be one of the big high dollar setups. What, what about for you? Yeah, so my, so, so my, I started my career on like booth design and like really leveraging because it's pre, pre-social media. Um, Arthrex has Arthrex has got a really good iconic booth, but it's just, it's been the same booth they've used for a long time. But it's a damn damn good booth. They're very right. smart because they use um they they ha- it costs a lot of money to do this. They elevate the booth by like a couple of inches, right? So there's a ramp that goes onto the booth. So that's a very smart thing that they do. Uh, yeah, so that's that's very smart. What I don't like is that the lighting is great. They have perfect lighting. It's like the thing that people skip out on. But if you go in their booth because of the peep, the amount of bodies and the lights, and it is hot in that booth, right? That's the only thing. Mm-hmm. I think the the company I've been most impressed with is Zimmer. You know, because like Striker and some of the other ones, they've they've done a good job. They have really nice, but Zimmer like really changed it up, and like they have a very like futuristic Tron like booth. Um, I'll say that, and they had some had some yeah. good uh, seating space. I pulled up and had a conversation with a couple people at Double AOS there that was good. Um, and, and you know, hey, always shout out to whoever's uh, got the espresso machine there uh, in the booth. Uh, those those are always good stops. Uh, yeah, Smith Nephews had cool stuff. If you've seen some of their three D printed oversized implants, um, yeah. you know, like this this, this Paul Bunyan tibia. Um, some stuff like that's cool. Yeah. I will say like, before, before we go to the next, next question, I will say like probably the, probably the most like, uh, what's, what's chutzpah move that I saw this year at double OS where I was like, and I actually sent their VP of marketing message. I'm like, 
That was a baller move. Was a con med who was set up directly across from Striker had a huge jumbotron TV and did all of their like live presentations directly facing Striker's main entry point. I was like, man, that was baller. I love 100%. that. I, I stood right there and wa- watched my man Scott Sigmund uh, giving a talk on uh, bio. Yes, I, I don't even do it. I just have to go see. I have to go see Scott and learn a little bit. And it, it was a cool setup. You're exactly right. Yeah, 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 totally. Okay, next next question. Outside of AAOS, like what's 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 one conference you love to attend? You feel like it's just like your favorite conference to go to. AAHKS. If you do hip and knee, I mean that that's it. And I mean, goodness gracious, it's huge now. Uh, it's not not quite the academy, but it, it's massive, and it's it's all things arthroplasty. Uh, Dallas is super easy to get in and out of. It's it's a great meeting every year, and, and they've continued to evolve that. All right, couple more couple more questions for you. Um, who do you feel? And again, this is not saying that you use their stuff and everything, but just from your exposure and everything, who do you think is kind of like a big, mighty, up and coming company in the space of ortho? Ooh, yeah, is it good? Right? Yeah, it it depends on who who's big and who's the giant versus. Uh, Versus who's up and coming, right? Um, I, I think you've got to look at some of the success of what Medacta has done the last few years. They've Interesting. Had some, they've had some big growth. They've done a lot of it on the educational side with anterior hip things. Um, medial pivot knee is is really starting to hit its stride and get a lot of attention. They've they pretty much gone. All, if not all in, it's a company that has a strong emphasis on uh, kinematic alignment uh, in conjunction with, with medial pivot knee. And I, defining what KA is and really getting that out at scale um, is, is still be to be determined how that's, that's going to happen. But they, they brought on some, some big names and some, some very influential surgeons doing their stuff. And I think they've got the, the market share growth to, to back that up. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I didn't expect that one. That's an interesting one. Okay. Well, my last question for you is like, at least on, on LinkedIn, actually, there's a two parter, two parter. Okay. Make an easy one. So the, the first one is on LinkedIn. Like what's your favorite hashtag to follow on LinkedIn? I don't even know what I've got entered. I think it's probably like joint replacement and orthopedic surgery and some of those things. I, I just, I just look at the feed and it's, it's all these people that I like and follow and interesting stuff. Got it. I probably need to do that. I probably need to follow some more hashtags. Yeah, yeah. No, hey, don't worry. I think by the time this episode's email out, me a list. Email yeah, me I'll a email list. list. I need to be looking at. I'll, I'll email you a list. And my last one for you is just, and you don't have to limit this to one, but who are some of your favorite, uh, uh, I guess, people in the ortho world on LinkedIn to like check out their content, engage with their posts? Like, who 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 kind of comes to mind? Oh man. Uh, that's it. I just, I just enjoy the, the whole community, uh, of who's out there and, and for, for different things and for different reasons. And that's the beauty of it is really being able to get those strong knowledge sources. A lot of places, uh, Vendasa, you know, who I met through, uh, LinkedIn and, and become a friend, um, always a great, great insight on sort of healthcare generally and on technology and, and how some of these things develop. You can go micro specific if you want to talk about hip implant placement uh, relative to the spine. I mean, Russ Bodner is, is the expert and he's there. Um, Corey Callendine uh, always has a, has a lot of great content. Um, and just friends that put up, up interesting cases and, you know, it changes all the time and, um, always interesting. Um, you know, it gets this international flavor. There's several of the European guys, uh, now and, and just seeing their take and how it differs sometimes from what we do is super interesting to me. Uh, Sean Palmer, um, not posting as often, but starting to comment again a little more, just, just coming out of, out of left field with this contrarian view on things that, that kind of keeps us honest, um, I think is great. I just, I just love that dynamic and those discussions. That's great. Yeah. And this is definitely a very, very good list of people. And again, like I love, I love the orthopedic community on LinkedIn. And what's exciting is that between that and then also Joey, 
there are other uh, medical yeah, communities yeah, yeah, that are yeah, getting so influence. I can't leave our oh. all from oh you know, yeah you know, the the Godfather what? himself and, and Joey <laughs> and, and um, you know what he's done there is is incredible to really um, legitimize and 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 make this a very um, a very systemic thing um, to have a to have a journal that gets a ton of eyeballs that's peer reviewed. I think soon, uh, hopefully, going to be accessible on PubMed. I think he's in process with that. So that's great exciting. Things. Yeah, I'm, I personally, I mean, uh, I was a good good friend. I think we've bonded over Saturday mornings, uh, zooming from our respective man caves, and so. Uh, you know, I really love what he's doing, and I'm. I personally want to encourage like more orthopedic companies to consider like funding certain engagements and projects through them because it's I'll tell you what, it's a hell of a lot better use of marketing dollars than like spending 10k on like I don't know hotel room key drop offs or something. Yeah, I think they're starting to figure that out a little bit. Um, and you talked about it with kind of the explosive growth on LinkedIn and a lot of it. Yeah. Um, because I'm connected and, and kind of constantly connecting with a lot of those people. It's a ton of orthopedic surgery residents. Uh, it's people that are young in their careers that are, you know, age wise are much more likely to, have, you know, they didn't grow up with it as children. They're not that young yet um, that are surgeons, but they they had it in in their educational process, you know, med school training, uh, college, even where they were exposed to that. Their their adult world has very much been been colored by those social media interactions, and so they're coming on there at scale. Some of them are making content, but a lot of them are just there and kind of taking in information and consuming and getting advice. I get some direct messages sometimes, things like that. And, and companies are realizing the the access that they have there um, that they don't, like you said, I mean, a room key drop off or a, a sticky that I've got to peel off a journal or, or something that, you know, <laughs> the, the last 20 people that sat in the position at the company also purchased this thing. So I'm going to do it too. But in, yeah. in terms of, of access or being able to, to meaningfully uh, talk to somebody or interact with them via a journal club with Joey or through post or through videos or zooms or, or, or these other uh, interactions They're They're starting to get hold of it and they're, they're trying to figure out how to do it and how to, how to be compliant, but how to, how to leverage some of those digital opinion leaders um, to, uh, to help them with what they do. Cause historically they've, like you said, they've, they've paid for ineffective advertising and they've also had consultants and, and key opinion leaders that, you know, they got on a podium a couple of times a year and, and they were, they were influential in that time. They were great speakers. And then 360 days of the year, they were completely invisible again. Um, yeah, exactly. That's a great point. That are, that are more engaged, that are, that are involved in a, a very dynamic, ongoing conversation about some of these topics. Yeah. And, you know, if anything, there's one thing I've learned from, uh, from the great uh, Dilbert creator, Scott Adams, who's also just, he's a trained hypnotist and also a brilliant, brilliant when it comes to persuasion. Uh, one really persuasive way to uh, change behavior is through um, embarrassment and making fun of something. And so at least in my own special way, I'm making, I'm going far out of my way to make fun of these different marketing initiatives so that people stop spending money on them, you know? Like I like I I mean at least at the startup level I tell board members all the time I talk about it on my pockets and everything is just like you should not be spending money on like a bus wrap or like some random like ad on page fifty of a journal like I don't care even if it's like uh, somebody somebody even asked me they're like well what if it's like five hundred dollars I'm like you're gonna pick that over let's say tar a targeted campaign on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter even like yeah you know so. It's okay. These things have existed so long because nobody came around to like really make fun of them. At this point, nobody's going to fire me because I work for myself now. So I'm just going to say whatever the hell I want at this point. <laughs> That's the cool thing about being independent. You know, you can, you know, make a skull and crossbones logo or you can talk about whatever you want. I t I'm telling you, man, that's like one of the best podcast logos I've seen in a long time. I've seen a lot of them. So thank you. <laughs>
Absolutely. Well, Dr. Barber, thank you so much for joining joining the show. We'll ha- definitely have you back. For those who are listening, a couple of reminders. Again, number one, check the show notes below. Unlock that AMA PRA category one credit. Number two, please, aside from giving Dr. Uh, Matt Barber a follow on LinkedIn, go check out his show, Ortho Real. That's correct. That's the name of the show, correct? Ortho Real? That's the name. Uh, you can find it on all, uh, all the podcast outlets, uh, Spotify, uh, YouTube, all that good stuff. Spotify, Apple, YouTube. And by the way, I, you know, I have a really active audience. So I want to encourage the audience members, do me a favor. I know you've already rated our show. Go check out Dr. Barber's show on Spotify or, or, or Apple. Take one second, rate it five stars and write a review. It'll take you one second to do it. We really have to do a better job of promoting and supporting these uh, industry podcasts because this it's all continuing education. It's a great way to make our industry great. So please make sure to take a second and go do that. So with that being said, I'm your host, Omar M. Khatib. This is another episode of the State of MedTech, and we'll see you all next time. Bye for now. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of the State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at Take care and we'll see you next time.